Hi, everyone. My name is Yulia Pavlova, and I'm a producer at Strelka Institute. Welcome, everybody who is watching us on YouTube, Facebook, and Kontakte. Tonight, a guest in Strelka 2020 live public program is Daniel Venturi, the director of Polymodo, the fashion design and business school in Florence, who this event is co-organized with. Mr. Venturi will tell us today about an investigation on the future of fashion called The Truth About Fashion, which was conducted by a group of fashion marketing and fashion and business of fashion students of Bali Moda. He will focus on key values of Generation Z, such as belonging, inclusivity, and authenticity, authenticity and will also try to dissect the transformed concept of luxury. There will be a Q&A session after the lecture, so please do not hesitate to post your questions on our social media, and I will pass them to Danilo. The lecture is in English with a simultaneous translation into Russian. Russian version is available on Strelka Institute page on Kontakte and Russian Facebook. And now, have a great time watching, and I shall pass the word to Danilo. Hello. Hi. I'm very happy to see you here and hear your voices. And obviously I don't see you and I can't hear your voices, but you can hear uh, mine and you can see me. And eventually we can be connected after for questions uh, about the lecture. Um, as said, uh, we conducted a research in school, because what we like to do in our school is to involve students in um, activities that can be useful for everybody, so activities that have an impact. And this that research actually has an impact on what luxury is, because what luxury is, is about perception of luxury. So this is already the key of everything. Because, as you can see from the slides, the first part of uh, this speech is about what normally luxury is meant to be. So, what is traditionally luxury? And luxury is about scarcity, and it's about the perception of scarcity. So, basically, luxury doesn't exist in nature. We create it. It's something very human. Just think to the possibility to conceive more quality and less quantity or vice versa and also connect this quantity quality to the price so just for giving you an example this is fashion where you have the quantity and you have the price. And this is luxury, where you have this quantity and you have this price. So less quantity, more price. This is the basic economic rule, which is for, we give for granted, right? It's something that we give for granted since childhood. Uh, when we go to our parents and we say, ah, I need money for this and that, but you know, the price has, set, has been set artificially and also the quantity of product in nature is there, but in culture, so in what humans do, is not there. It's decided. And also, you know, when we give value to something, uh, we decide to give value to something. For example, we give for granted, we take for granted that gold is precious, right? But actually, gold is just a metal. Or we say that uh, diamonds are uh, expensive and they are rare and, yeah, sure, but it's just a stone. So we humans decide what is rare, what is scarce, what is precious as a consequence. Then luxury is also a way uh, to organize uh, the society, and this is quite traditional. I think if you have an economic background, you all know about the Maslow pyramid. So it's a pyramid where basically on the basement, if it's a real pyramid, you have a basement, you have basic needs. So like food, 
commodities, what we need for, uh, you know, eating and covering ourselves, and it's just commodities. And then as long as you go up, you have more precious products that are, you know, leaving the state of need and it's joining the state of desire up to the top, the very top, when you have unique pieces. So something that is made only for you and it's precious. Like, for example, in the previous centuries, it was very spread, much less today. But if you go to a painter and you ask for a paint only of yourself, and it takes like, I don't know, six months, one year, and then this goes to the next generations, this is the top of the top of the top of luxury because it's only for you and it's made for you and it took time and one person worked only for you, you know? So this is the pyramid. So considering the pyramid, luxury is from the half of the pyramid up. When you go down, you have fashion, you have fast, fast fashion and just commodities. So again, this is all artificial. It's all in our heads. We decided what stays in the pyramid and what place uh, is, you know, given to each product or brand. Then there's another way to consider luxury, which is the top tier of fashion. And here there's a lot of mess between the two concepts because luxury and fashion conceptually are very different. I would say opposite because fashion is based on inclusion. It means that um, brands spread the product into the market, hoping that a lot of people are gathering around the product itself and the brand as a consequence or vice versa, depending on strategies. While luxury is exactly the opposite. Luxury is meant to exclude others. So to keep the product and the brand only for few and keep all others, you know, out of that game. But uh, in recent years, I mean, decades, compared to the history of the human beings, it's nothing. Uh, we decided that the top tier of fashion can be considered a certain kind of luxury. So we changed the concept and we just, you know, went to the point of, you know, trading stuff, selling things and giving them a price and putting them in a shop. So conceptually speaking, the difference is not respected, but it's still there. And you can see it uh, from a very simple question. If I put you a question like, is Louis Vuitton or Gucci luxury? Somebody might say yes, because it depends on the money they have in their pockets. Uh, I mean, if they cannot afford these brands, for them it's luxury. But actually, if I then say Hermes, it's a bit more luxury. So more luxury shouldn't exist in nature, in culture, when we decided what luxury is, because luxury is absolute, it's not comparative. But today it is. So let's take it and let's use it. Then there's another reason why luxury doesn't exist in nature. And it's because luxury is personal. So we all have a different point of view on what luxury is because uh, we mix certain key values, certain topics, certain ideas of uh, luxury. It's like chemistry. It's the same cocktail with different ingredients for each one of us. And these key values are the brand, the heritage, design, quality, price, uniqueness, emotion, or if you want emotional involvement, sacrality, prestige, and authenticity. So these key values that now I'm going to explain one by one can be thought, felt, interpreted in different ways, depending on the country, depending on the age, but also depending on your very personal sensibility. So what is the brand? 
First of all, the brand is a container. It's a container of values. It's a container of a vision, which means how you see the world, and a mission, which means achievements, which means uh, uh, aspirations. And the brand is meant to create a certain reflectability, meaning that the client should identify as much as possible into the brand. And the activity of the brand is to create this mirror, this identity that hopefully is matching to the client. So basically the brand is the space, that specific idea of product, colors, symbols, that we call brand occupies in your brain. And obviously for giving a certain visibility to the brand and to make the brand recognizable, we have another concept which is called smashability. From smash to smash. For example, if I take an object and I smash it on the floor and that object goes in pieces, in thousand pieces, I might recognize from every single piece what was the brand on that product or without seeing the fragments of the logo, of any logo, but just seeing the material, touching the material or seeing how bright it is, a certain color or not, and how round or square is a, a shape of a product, I can understand if it was a brand or another one. Just for giving you a few examples, um, you have certain identifiers, which is the recurrent um, colors and symbols and prints and materials that a brand is using, which are defining each or almost every product from that brand. So for example, if I cut a trench coat uh, by Burberry in hundreds or even thousand pieces, from every single piece, I can understand that that is, or that was at that point, a Burberry trench coat because of the tartan and every single piece is still having a little portion of that tartan. So the more you have reflectability, the more you have smashability, the more you are recognizable, and the more you are recognizable, the more the brand is working in your mind. And then another part of the brand that which is fundamental is the extension. So how much a brand can be extended so you have brand extensions or you have line extensions, uh, which means that, for example, Prada started with bags and now it's considered one of the pret a -Porter maximum expressions. So that was an extension, you know? Or when you have already the full range of key core products and the extension becomes the sunglasses, and then maybe somebody else is managing that line of products for you, so you give it away. So the more you extend the brand, obviously, the more you might be profitable, but at the same time, the more you are going to dilute your brand, and so to escape and go far away from the concept of luxury, which should be a small amount of products belonging to that brand. Then the second element is heritage. So heritage is about the know-how, first of all. Know-how on how you do things. So is it artisanal? Is it made by hand? Or, yeah, it is artisanal, but then sold in a shop. Maybe your own laboratory on the street is becoming the shop or it's artisanal because maybe you have already patterns. So um, you can you know, modify patterns on the body of someone and that is called made to measure, or you can do directly on the body without patterns and that is called bespoke. 
And so this is the part that uh, looks more like luxury. Well, then you have prototype production. So when you uh, come with uh, pattern making and you make uh, different sizes and you diversify the product in order to be industrialized. Uh, so, for example, pret a is made like that or industrial directly when, you know, sketches and drawing or even only the idea is becoming the product and it's massively industrialized. At that point, it's not luxury anymore because the quantity is too, uh, it's too much. Then when we talk about heritage, we have to say that we have a memory of art, which means how much the branding and the marketing of a brand is based on the memory of the first products, the identity of the family, of the founders, for example, but also the art of memory, which is uh, heritage marketing. So, for example, the fact that some brands have their own museum uh, or they just uh, use archives to do new things. And this heritage could be also linked to the territory, to the origins of the brand. Uh, as Polimoda, as uh, Mr. Ferragamo, Ferruccio, as a president, uh, we always say that um, this brand is strictly linked to Florence and to Tuscany. So when you talk about this brand, you immediately have in mind Tuscany and Florence. So that's happening because uh, in the past, especially, uh, the brand communicated the link with the family, with the territory, with the city. And so it's there in a small folder in our brain. Whenever we see the brand, we see the territory. And then another element, which is design. Design is very important and it's very underestimated because in the last decades, we focused a lot on marketing. So the design side, um, in my opinion, a bit ended with Alexander McQueen and the exit of John Galliano from Dior. So that was a key moment where design uh, began to be or to be considered a bit secondary and marketing a bit primary in the actions of brands, luxury brands. But, you know, design is very important because it's defining the level of uh, innovation and the level of repetition. So the more the innovation, the more the luxury. The more the repetition, the less the luxury. So good design, according to Dieter Rams, uh, should be as little as possible. But here we have different opinions and different perceptions because we will see in another key value that people like a lot of product, an excessive and visible product, some other people like it minimal. So, but who is defining that is design. So design is very important because it's deciding what a brand and set of products is in the end. Uh, when you use recurrent identifiers and you use them, uh, repeating them along the years, and maybe from time to time you have new ones, then at that point uh, you can create a shadow of the future. The shadow of the future is a paradoxical concept, that, which means that you can't remember the beginning of that brand and you can't figure out the end of that brand. For example, when you think at Chanel, uh, actually, yeah, you, you know that there was a Madame Chanel in the beginning and you would never think that this brand could end some, sometimes you know, in the future. So this is called shadow of the future. And the more a brand has that, the more as conceived or conceivable as luxury. Then you have quality. Quality can be intrinsic because it's, you know, the object itself is a quality. It can be perceived 
which means that through marketing you create a perception of quality or it can be added when in competition you add a single quality to defeat your competitors. Real luxury shouldn't have competitors. You do what you do, you are what you are, your client is what it is. While we said luxury today is also top tier fashion, so we also have to consider the added value. Um, again, if we consider Dieter Ram's rules, in luxury, you shouldn't offer more than what you promised, but you shouldn't even promise more than you can offer. So there's a certain balance between what you can do in quality, what can you achieve in terms of quality, and what you promised to your clients directly or indirectly, and what you deliver in the end. So if you break this, uh, you know, hidden or untold contract, then you break the value of the brand and the quality is not perceived any longer. Um, again, also in quality, you can have shadow of the future because also quality can define the shadow of the future. If you have a product that is never ending and you keep, keep on using it and it goes from generation to generation, or you know, maybe you use your grandma handbag then that is part of the shadow of the future. Then you have price. So also price is defining what luxury is, or better, maybe luxury is defining the price. It works uh, to, you know, two ways. Um, first of all, the price in fashion is usually set by markup. So you have a cost and then you add and you have the final class price. While in luxury, <coughs> sorry, in luxury you have a price that is set I from the beginning and from the perception and from the kind of scheming you want to do of your clients. So for example, I know perfectly that a certain product uh, cost me 100, by, but I sell it 1,000 because I want to prevent certain people to buy it. So at a certain point, I skim, I select my clients. This is part of the luxury system. And then obviously, when you have the price, you have the value for money, which is not only linked to the power of the brand, to the quality, the design and the heritage, but it's also about convenience. So if it's good to buy in a certain moment, in a certain way, with a certain service. So it's not only the product, but what composes the whole merchandising system of a product, set of products by the brand. Then you have the concept of uniqueness. Uniqueness is about how the client and the customers feel by having a certain product of a certain brand. So if you feel unique, most probably that is luxury. If you don't, because you know perfectly that other people have it or you see them and you're sure they have it. So the more this happens, the less it's luxury. Can you imagine you go to a party with a new, I don't know, jacket that you bought today and you're supposed to feel and to be unique in the party and you see another three people wearing that. Well, that is not luxury. This is, you know, a way to distinguish what is luxury and what is not. How you feel. And this is what I was telling before when I introduced the difference uh, between fashion and luxury. So the more is about inclusion, so the more the brand tends to include people, uh, the less people feel unique and the other way around. So for this reason, a real luxury brand should never do any benchmark. So should never compare uh, itself to other brands. Um, real luxury, in theory, should be, I do what I do, I sell what I sell, I have the client I have at the price we agreed. So the more you bench, Mark, the less you are luxury. 
because uniqueness is a value for the clients, but it's also a value for the brand. So the more a brand feels unique itself, and also the work is in that brand, the more is the feeling of luxury. Then you have emotion. Emotion is an irrational attraction uh, to something because you have to know that due to the way our brain is constructed, mm, there are primary feelings which are instincts of survival and reproduction. Then you have other, uh, another part of the brain that is younger and developed later, which is the part of emotions. And then you have, we have a small por portion, which is the youngest part of our brain in our evolution, which makes us rational. Or better, we think we are rational because statistics prove that 95% of purchases are thought irrationally and only after we decided to buy, we uh, justify ourselves why we bought. Basically, when you see something and you say, that is mine, absolutely has to be mine, I want it. Um, and then you start to think, okay, uh, what is the price? Uh, when do I wear it? And you see yourself wearing it in a certain occasion. So you see that you are playing a role thanks to that product. So you have an emotion thanks to that. Good. Uh, this process I, I talked about can last, can be, you know, a split second. So I took five minutes to explain it, but in our brain it happens in a split second. So first of all, we buy it with our desire. And then we justify why we buy it. So that, that event that happens in our brain is called emotion. And it's linked to sensuality, meaning to the five senses. And the more the brand and the product is using and fostering the use of senses, the more it's attractive and desirable. So it's also sometimes about seduction and the game of seduction and the game of scarcity is working in a very similar way. So uh, seduction and scarcity are about setting people apart from others. So if you isolate the mind of a consumer, that consumer is the victim. Um, so yeah, that is part of the luxury game. And then another part is sacrality, um, which for making it easy, you can perceive the sense of sacrality after you bought something precious and something you really like and something you know is luxury. So you keep it clean, you keep it repaired, you, you know, there's a certain sacrality of that object occupying a space in your house after you bought it and you pay attention when you wear it. So it's also becoming a ritual because you decide to wear it only in certain occasion. So there's a rituality and rituality comes from religion. So there's a certain element of sacrality that brings luxury to be considered something absolute, something to be respected, something divine for its design, its quality. Uh, so, yeah, in this case, uh, places count a lot because if it's something hard to find, um, also this might be a ritual. If it's easy to find, easy to buy, the ritual is killed, so the sense of luxury is not there anymore. And then also a matter of symbols. So here we go to that part of the brand that we call logo, which is a, just a print, it's a symbol. And we could talk about symbols and logos and fashion and luxury for 100 hours because there's a, you know, a full story about that. But first symbols in the human being were religious. So just for saying, Mm, not only graphic symbols, but also, you know, linked to other senses, for example, perfume. How to explain that? You know, let's, let, let's use um, Latin. 
In Latin, the word per fumum meant to burn a wood that created smoke, so fumum, and the smoke was meant to reach gods. So you can see that uh, the primary use of perfume was to reach gods, uh, even though the second was to, um, to mask the smell of surgery, which is not that nice. But anyways, the first was religious. And then uh, prestige. Prestige is creating a difference between what is luxus in Latin and what is luxuria. So luxus is when um, the focus are, is on quality, but is also on quality of life. And you buy luxury for self-treating. So for treating yourself well. And traditionally, this kind of purchase is linked to a certain kind of client called old money. Uh, and then you have luxuria, which is the nasty side of luxury, meaning they, they show off. So buying something to show your position in the society or just to show among a small group of people that you are the best, the richest, you know. So it's another side of luxury. Uh, so when we think at luxury and the focus is on quality, we think at luxury in a positive way. When it's based on show off, uh, then maybe it's not that that positive, at least today. Or um, you know, and then it's a game of appearing and disappearing. So being present or being absent. So the more things are absent today, the more they are precious. So when you think at uh, luxury, like something for you to appear, hmm, mean, I mean, maybe in the 80s that was luxury. Today it's not. i just give you an example um, about a hotel I used to attend uh, many, many years ago. And the suite, the most important suite, was in the center of the village, they I. So the people who were housed, living in the small areas and houses of the village hotel could see who was the richest. And the richest could occupy that place on top of the hill and people could see it, you know. And now, in the same hotel, the most prestigious and important suite is hidden in the wood, so that you cannot see who is occupying that place. So, from this example, I think it should be quite clear of how luxury changed or might change in the game of appearing and disappearing, which is also a game of seduction, so we go back to emotion and we go back to scarcity. The last key value that is composing uh, luxury is the feeling of authenticity. So we all know that a uh, luxury product can be reproduced and sold bootlegged and, you know, like gray market or black market and so on. So, but here we need to be more subtle because it's too easy to associates the idea of original to the idea of authentic with the and the idea of fake with the idea of unauthentic because actually you can also could also have hybrid perceptions like something that is original because it's created by the company and this you know it is a mark it's really created by a company but it's not authentic because maybe that company took an inspiration from another one. Or when we have a fake, and the fake is so, so well done and recreated that it's more authentic in the perception than the original, which maybe was, you know, a, a reproduction itself or a mass production. <laughs> so, for example, again, let's go back to Burberry trench. If I take a trench, I know that that trench is reproduced massively. 
but if I cut the trench in pieces and we have smashability, so we rewind, rewind the lesson and we go to the concept of smashability, then I take all pieces and with those pieces, I, I create a piece of art. So at that point, the piece of art is, uh, you know, it's a fake because it's not the original trench, but it's more authentic than the trench, which is reproduced in series, you know? So the game between original equal to authentic and fake equal to unauthentic is there in luxury, especially today when we call uh, this game cultural appropriation, which is really, really difficult to be discussed. And again, it would take hours and hours to arrive to a certain point. This idea of authenticity, and here is the game I play with words, authenticity, scar city. It means also that luxury is an urban phenomenon. So luxury is born and grown in the urban areas. And it's so spread in the urban areas like metropolis um, that somehow it makes the city and the feeling you have of the city. So how the city is also attracting people and keeping people from outside. So what is the kind of entertainment, what they sell and how they host people. So for understanding this, uh, just quote Andy Warhol, uh, when he came to Florence, he stated that the most uh, authentic place in Florence was McDonald's. Obviously, that was a provocation because McDonald's was so strange to be seen in that kind of Florence at that time that was looking as the most original in the sense the most diverse thing from all the rest. But also the fact, in Andy Warhol words, that uh, most probably when tourism, quality tourism, becomes mass tourism, you have the, the, the smaller, you know, feeling of, of luxury linked to a city, even if the city is a open air museum and you literally walk on history in that city. So I told about Florence because it's the city where I live and where the school is based and I didn't want to offend any other city, so I used my city. But if you want, we have stories also about Venice and other cities similar to this one. So authenticity is also a way to live luxury in a city, taking time for yourself. So where going around the city and lose yourself, like the life of the flaneur or the dandy, um, is creating a way, in, in a way, in your brain is creating the situation that you are more free and that you could move in that city and you have a kinesthetic situation happening in your brain where you see yourself like moving there and living there and having another life uh, but maybe that happens only during a holiday and then obviously you have to go home. But when you have that feeling in the city, uh, then that city has a kind of luxury in itself. When you don't, well, then no, it's a mass, mass merchandising city and it's not a kind action. So whatever you find in the city, people, behaviors, shops, and environments, the kind of the relationship between nature and culture is defining if a city provides you a certain kind of luxury or not. Well, what's happening? It's happening that we asked our students what they think, you know, about this luxury. And they said, well, actually luxury for us is not relevant <laughs> so it was about 300 students uh, attending business courses uh, students from 50 different nations, nations consider that uh, when the school is full 
We have people from 70 different nations. And they were half Generation Z and half Millennials. So in their 20s and almost 30s. And they conducted the research called The Truth About Fashion, where they evaluated the values, brands, and communications of current fashion, actually fashion luxury, I mean, not mass merchandising brands. And we adults decided, I mean, the faculty decided not to ask them questions or not, you know, influence the answers. So we decided instead to let them do everything, like pose questions and give answers among themselves. And the outcome was great. I mean, really, really game changing. Um, and this is the way we do. I mean, if we want to do something for young generations, we need, we have to let them do it directly. So what is the outcome of this research? Uh, don't bother because at the end of the presentation, we have the link where you can uh, access the research for free. So I'm just telling you about, you know, we learned with it, but not all data and percentages and names of brands and everything. This is something that you can check alone afterwards. So first thing we learned, slogans, we read everywhere and that part of the game of the news, but also the branding that our brands put out. Slogans like diversity, sustainability, and authenticity are not new for them. Uh, instead, they are given for granted more. They consider this language as not their language. So they consider that these keywords, newspapers, magazines, and brands, and teachers also use, are not you know, reflecting the language they use. And when we talk about diversity, sustainability, and authenticity, it's something for them, especially for the Gen Z, it's given for granted because they had it since, you know, birth, actually. It's, it's not something that they had to uh, inherit like we did or to educate ourselves to it but they had it. Like, I give you an example. When we uh, evaluate students at the entrance, we always ask about their personal story. So more and more Gen Z students are telling about, like, I don't know, like I'm from Australia, but my mother is Japanese and my father is, um, is um, Italian origin, so, but I started in the USA because my father moved to USA for business and now I want to study in uh, Italy to find back my roots and, but my boyfriend is German and we want to meet, uh, you know, in Moscow. Who, you say, what, what, what are you, you know? And so we, in our generation, we need to define them through the word diversity, but they are already diverse. So this is what I mean when I say uh, give for granted. And the same is for sustainability and authenticity. It's something they have already in their behaviors. So keep on pushing with that is not working, is not useful. And it's defining a kind of communication for old, for elder people, trying to target young people and they actually detect it very easily if it's you know um honest or not um so then if communication shouldn't be based on that what is the key and so that said it should be more educational meaning it should be more about uh giving content uh without necessarily branding it and maybe making our brands a culture uh, operator. So it's more about giving content and involve people and let them do things.
things like giving them opportunities to express themselves more than you know sell products advertising them and play the role of the good in the society which again i think they detect very easily so the sense of luxury as i explained for half an hour before is completely destroyed and what they said is we don't consider luxury as a word mm, there's no difference for us uh, when we talk about luxury or non-luxury, that is not a point for us. For us, it's a point when we talk about freedom, when we talk about expression, belongingness, and freedom of expression. So the brands that they have in their mind is, first of all, Gucci is far, far the top of mind uh, in these generations, but also Jacquemus, and Rick Owens, Magella, Prada uh, have a share of mine, a good share of mine. About the new uh, emerging brands, uh, we have Gabriela Erst and Pangaya, uh, Bethany Williams and Nudie Jeans. So as you can see, all brands that have the concept of sustainability embedded. So it's not something, you know, a brand that is not sustainable or was not sustainable and is trying to be sustainable and is communicating sustainability to be perceived as sustainable. But the concept of sustainability is embedded in the brand itself. And it's, it's the key for the brand to exist, you know. So this is, again, it's what I mean when I say they give it for granted. So, yeah, new... Key values are freedom, expression, belongingness, meaning that they gather in groups, but they would also like brands to gather them and to let them express what they feel, what they think, what they would like to do. Again, as I said in the beginning, the best way to do something for young people is, is to let them do it. Just let them do it. Don't do something as an adult for young people thinking that you target them. That is not working anymore. If you want them, you have to involve them directly. So, last part of this lecture. Uh, I mean, is it a lecture or is it a speech? I don't know. I mean, of this thing. Um, it's my personal advice and it's part of my personal research and something that I wrote already in books or in newspapers. And it's a third part, it's called simplicity. So the first was scarcity, and it was about the traditional lecture. The second was authenticity. So what is really authentic, meaning what the real targets, again, this word, uh, really think and feel and want, and then, Simplicity, what is going to happen tomorrow? We're also considering that we are not in normal times. We are in times of pandemic. So uh, not, not uh, normal at all. But I, I must say that fashion luxury was ill even before the COVID. Uh, we, we had too much production, which is not good for the planet. We had too much uh, tension for sales, which is not good for human relations. And, you know, also a certain redundancy in style meant the denial of fashion, but even a good part of luxury that is based on design. So maybe we should think what is going to be tomorrow. And first, I would say creativity is the origin of all other positive values. Why? Because if we have a free kind of creativity and institutions, schools, brands foster, like push people to be creative instead of not to be creative, but commercial, uh, you know, creativity needs diversity because real creativity comes from the clash from different cultures uh, or from different ideas even in your head. If not outside, it can happen inside, but you need multidisciplinarity, you need different inputs, 
So you need diversity for being created. And diversity brings to authenticity because the more you have different things, the more each thing is authentic. And the more you use different things, the more you have the possibility to come up with something authentic in what you do. And authenticity brings to sustainability because when you have something authentic and you buy it as a new kind of luxury, and here we are to the point. The point is the new luxury is based on creativity, brings to diversity, diversity brings to authenticity, authenticity brings to sustainability. Why? Because what we buy and what we wear is defining who we are and what we do. And it's also defining in the society uh, who is doing what to whom. So roles, which are not pyramids, but are relations, okay? So when we don't know who we are, we tend to buy too much and we cosplay. We change and we know that we can buy a lot because worst case, we can send it back or, you know, what we buy might be very, so cheap that if we got mistaken in our purchase, who cares? And so that is not sustainable. While when we know exactly who we are, we don't need so much stuff. We need exactly that stuff we have in mind and we don't throw it quite easily. We throw it only when it's broken and we substitute. We buy another one that looks maybe similar or it's an update. So we consume less and we consume better if we know who we are. So sustainability comes from creativity. You don't have to kill creativity and then, you know, to communicate sustainability. It's, it's, it's all linked, you know, it's embedded. And this is the lesson we learned from our students. Second, city based on human capital are creating more value than cities on fire. I mean, not because they are on fire. Fire is a way to say finance, industry and real estate. If you go to the history of New York, for example, but also other cities, Milan has something as well, like very similar, you know, um, occupying areas that were destroyed or abandoned before and to gentrify them. Well, who's doing that? First of all, artists go to those areas and then investment come. Um, something we did quite recently, two years ago, started with a new location for Polymoda, it's a third facility, and it was an abandoned uh, tobacco factory, it's called Manifattura Tabacchi, but it's not, you know, it's not just a building, it's a kind of monument of Italian history completely abandoned outside Florence, and we gentrified it completely, and now it's wow. So this is what I mean. Uh, in that area now, students go, and with students also artists, and with artists always the uh, restaurants and clubs, and, and it's, it's becoming something where to invest also for finance and real estate. So who is leading the city today or even tomorrow should consider that, first of all, you should uh, make the city center creative, gentrify what is outside with creative activities because these things are bringing the sense of neighborhood of collaboration which is you know the concept of um of collective of interzone of belongingness that our students told before so the idea that yeah okay i'm able to do jackets the other one is able to do shirts and someone else is shaving very, very well or not shaving at all. So they put something together and the startup is there and then they change it and then someone is coming from outside. This sense of community and belongingness comes only if cities focus on the main activity of uh, creation, art, fashion, music, cinema, you know, performative arts and so on. Third point, uh, fashion luxury brands um, should, and they already started some of them, to sell culture. So 
uh, that's also why because that's also why Gucci is top of mind because Gucci is doing that already since years. But I saw, for example, Saint Laurent now is doing it in a few shops, like the shop in Paris, City Center. They, they, on, they, they don't sell only the categories of product they used to sell and supposed to sell, like clothing and accessories, but they sell books and they sell it in an environment that looks more like a bibliotheque, like a library more than a shop, you know? So they are selling culture or they are just publishing videos without any commercial purpose, just, you know, to catch your attention and give you a valuable content. So in the end, the process of selling is becoming different. It's not pushing, it's pulling. It's about, uh, you know, involving people uh, in sharing what is your vision of the world. And you do it through, again, books, you do it through videos, movies, songs, and so on. And that is bringing people to you because they share your interest or they feel interested for the first time. And then, maybe selling is the consequence. So that should be also a game changer in the uh, professional figures. When we say brand manager, well, what is the brand manager tomorrow? Maybe a curator, a culture manager, or even if we want to go extreme ahead of education, if we consider this kind of activities as a form of education of, of people. Um, and then the education also of the brand, because people give a feedback. So the brand educates people, but people educate the brand. So it's an exchange, you know. Last slide, and then you're free. <laughs> Freedom is a value today, right? Uh, simple, human-centered life is the new luxury in the city. So uh, being a faculty in contact with so many students, well, students don't study only, they live, you know? So they have objects on the table, they tell you where they live, and they tell you where they go when they're not in school. So a new trend is reading and feeding your brain as a form of new entertainment. So expect that in the future, uh, things like series to watch and to be addicted to are decreasing their attendance and uh, like I don't know you can use directly the internet or apps if you want apps giving you more things to read and maybe read it easily like deciding the format of the way you read well this is becoming much more uh, much more important than the series it's something that you see also when uh, um, you see an increase of podcast consumption, which is strange because podcast, pod, podcast is a, uh, how to say, it's an inferior form because less complete than the video. But then it's good because you can feed your brain while you're doing something else. So you see that this is going with deleting the toxic relations that you have in your life, like people writing you continuously or interrupting your concentration, not letting you do, a, you know, conduct a proper life because they, they are too present, and so you delete them. Or another trend <coughs> is going away, leaving social networks, social media, or if not leaving, using them much less. And this came also during the COVID as main trend. Like if you uh, controlled or checked the social media during the COVID, we had two completely different reactions. One was, uh, I just post what I eat, or the wall, a fly on the wall, you know, going very raw. And other people instead even posing even to, you know, more than before. But this is minority. While before we had a spread posing system in the socials that is not there any longer. So people want, and this is the last part of the trend, less products and more experience. 
Second point, innovations on the use and occasion always made fashion start again after negative events. Meaning that if we go back to history of fashion luxury, we see that between the two wars, uh, brands like Chanel and Ferragamo introduced new materials, new cultural references, new uses and occasions for what they did, and even new colors. Because remember that the color black introduced by Chanel was not used in fashion before. So, uh, but not even the jersey material or Ferragamo started to use cork or uh, the skin of fishes were not used before, you know. Uh, so great innovations of products and also the way to use the products came during the two wars. And if we consider after the Second World War in Italy, we had Emilio Pucci starting with what we called after Preta Pote. Um, or we can consider Dior in France that started with uh, a new idea of fashion, which was much linked to uh, media and to masses, even if not affordable, but very visible. So magazines. Um, you know, that kind of fashion that we knew for the last century uh, up to a few years ago. And, and then if we go to 1978, we see that Giorgio Armani, for example, like just destructuring the shoulders of the men's jacket and so make it more free changed completely the use of the jacket. And by changing the use of the jacket, like from that moment, not only for, you know, professional use or evening use, but every day, every night, whatever, with whatever you want, also with jeans and T-shirts, like this changed completely menswear. And 78 was another international crisis because of oil, because of terrorism and so on. So as you can see, this should be the moment for fashion and luxury to come up with innovation. Whenever you have an innovation, the wheel of fashion luxury starts again and also economy starts again. But it doesn't start from saving, it starts from investment. It doesn't start from marketing, it starts from design. Okay, so this is a precondition. And then, last, promise, um, make more time and space for people. People want, want you know, time and space for themselves. You see it also, you know, during the COVID, we got used to work from home. And this, for example, for our school, increased performance a lot, a lot, much more than working uh, on site. Uh, but not because they were working more, but simply because they were working better, with a, a better sense of freedom, the organization of time, and the idea of having time and space for yourself, the way you like it, and, you know. So, again, we go to Dieter Rams. Uh, if you have the possibility to find out this author, he was the designer of Brown video radios. Um, Produce and buy less and better. That's it. Thank you. Here you have the sources, books. So my book, Elizabeth Curry, about the world economy, and Greg McEwan about essentialism, reduce you know consumption to the best you can. And here you have also uh, immediately after. You also have links where to download um, the research we conducted with our students and other articles, you know, going in depth of what I said today. So thank you. Thank you for attending. If there are questions, I'm ready to listen if we have time. Who's moderating this speech, actually? Danilo, thank you so much. Uh... It's true, we have some questions from our viewers. The first one, um, 
What do you think uh, describes the relationship between fashion and city the best? Like movies, online media, some academic sources. I remember like a decade ago, a fashion blogs, fashion street style blogs were very popular. What, what sources of CZ fashion relationship now? This is a recurrent question. Actually, it's a difficult question because we don't have, you know, the crystal ball. Uh, but I think, um, again, during the COVID, we were forbidden to use our hands, our legs, to see people, to talk to people in person, to shake hands, to, you know, go to a concert or to a fashion show. And I think this is what people want. And they learned a lesson because uh, using the social media was interesting and fun while you're doing something real outside, but it's not fun anymore when you have only that. So they realize that. And so the use of the media, of social media, uh, changed a lot a long time. I mean, I'm X generation, so I know what my space was. Most of our listeners, I think, don't know what, what my space was, but it was a way, you know, a free way to create your website and publish what, what you created, mostly music. Uh, and then we had Facebook that was basically a reduction of possibilities of MySpace. Yeah, you could publish, but mostly third party things and with a clear format for everybody that was not customizable anymore. And then we had Instagram, which is the reduction of, you know, of Facebook, because basically what you publish there is a picture, is a slogan and an emoji. So we saw that the social media went from the blog, MySpace, and then Facebook, and then Instagram. So what is next? Nothing. I mean, if you reduce everything to the minimum, what do you have next? Nothing. Mm, impossible. So when you arrive to that point, you go back to the essence. And the essence is human relationships. The best media of the future is going outside and meet people. That's it. Thank you. Uh, well, you started talking about pandemic, and well, I ask you, how how do you think will the fashion world change after the pandemic, and um, will it change? Your predictions on that? Uh, there are different changes depending on uh, who is the subject. So, if the client is the subject, there will be two opposite reactions, but. One would be major and the other one would be the reaction. The major kind of purchase after the COVID would be essentialist. Like we learned how to get rid of the orcs, like fluffy things out. Just go to the core and buy a better thing of the core we need or we like or we desire. So also in terms of style, I see a bit a end for the maximalism in style and the coming back of minimalism. Uh, obviously, when you have a main trend, which in my opinion would be that, you have the counter trend. You know, when you have a trend, you always have a reaction. When uh, seven, 10 brands are leading the, the, the style of fashion in that moment and they go all in the same direction, you have another three, four, five doing the opposite as a consequence. So. It's, that's why it's difficult to understand trends because in a given situation, you see both things. But what is important is who started before and who is leading the game. So from the point of view of creativity, brands and, you know, trends and consumptions, this would be the thing. Uh, from the point of view of the system, it's hard to tell because some brands, like for example Gucci and Saint Laurent during the pandemic, told that they are going to produce, create, produce, distribute, and communicate only what they like, what they feel, when they feel it. Which would be, I mean, amazing, because in that way you always have something new, 
and it's not overwhelming and it's not oppressive because you have too many collections to see and to go and visit shops and stuff. But, you know, you just, you just know that there's something new and you go to the shop and you find it and you have that feeling of newness that my generation used to have in the 80s and 90s um, and that we didn't have anymore in the zeros and the tens. So from that point of view, it would be great. But I don't know if that could work because, you know, another, another way to be for humans is to create chaos. Chaos is happening when history is changing. So in a specific change of a system, you have a moment of chaos and then you have order again. So in the state of chaos, having this idea of producing what you want when you want is good, but I don't know if it's going to last. And I wish, but I don't think so. So what will be the next system? I don't know. Uh, supposed to be more sustainable, like... Unfortunately, during the COVID, many companies, organizations and stuff couldn't survive because, uh, you know, they closed down. They had to. And closing down for them means that they weren't open. So somehow only the strongest survive or the newest. Those who have a new idea to cover the white space that was left by the others. So there would be a change in system for sure, but system is a system. When it's a system, then it's a system, you know. So we will have another system. I don't know which one. I think not that different from the previous one. Very simply understanding and reminding that it's not given for granted, that you should, shouldn't do too much, just do what you have to do. So, yeah, this is what I think for the future. Well, we'll wait and see, I guess. Yeah. For ourselves. Yeah. Um, there is an opinion that fashion world doesn't need that amount of fashion week that we have now, uh, which is actually comes hand in hand with sustainability. What is your personal opinion on that? Uh, I believe in freedom. So if a city of a single country wants five fashion weeks, uh, then it would be people deciding if going or not. So there's a selection, you know, what we call market or freedom or the same as in the relations between Milan, Paris, London and New York, which are the major fashion weeks. I think they will all survive and restart like before. I don't think they will reduce anything. Uh, right the contrary, when it will be possible, there will be an explosion. Of it. But again, it's then people deciding where to go and how long to stay and what to write about what they see. So, uh, yeah, this is what I think. Freedom. If we want 500 fashion weeks, for me, it's fine. I go to two, maximum three of them. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> Do you think that digital marketing make you an identity of these heritage brands that you mentioned in the beginning? Because brands are forced to move to digital to survive? Mm. Well, I think the big mistake there is not going digital, uh, but it's the way you go digital. So if you take content uh, from offline, like, I don't know, billboards or printed magazines or the window of a shop, and you bring it to the digital, then it doesn't work. The digital is something that has its own rules. And you cannot just transfer content that you have and adapting the format because it's not about that. It's about behaviors and etiquettes. So when, for example, our students are saying that the communication of brands today is oppressive, 
It's because they don't stand. You cannot stand advertising inside Instagram. But brands keep on doing it. Why? Because in mind, what they have, uh, the advertising before was, I don't know, on TV. Now it's in Instagram. Uh, it's not working like that. Uh, Instagram is another place where people are supposed to exchange, uh, you know, content that is created by them. It's amateurial somehow, and it's not advertising. So, uh, yeah, I think the, 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 the point is how much you use it and how you use it and not if you use it because you have to. Well, Daniela, thank you so much for the lecture and your answers. I think that is for now. Uh, if you want to say something, you have your chance now to do that. What I want to say is uh, be happy. And for being happy, you have to make space for yourself, for your brain, for your life, and nurture your brain with valuable things and valuable speakers, books, contents of every kind. Don't follow the fluffy things. Don't follow the trends. Don't follow what brands tell you. Just, you know, be happy. That's it. Thank you. Um, I just want to add that this lecture will be available on YouTube and all Australia social media platforms. Please subscribe, follow us, and keep your eyes on strelka.com for more events. Um, thank you, everyone, for being with us tonight. Bye.